So if you, if you don't know me, my name is Josh, and over the past five weeks, we've been in a sermon series called Third Way. And the premise of this series was that Jesus has asked his people to go into the world and be salt and light in the world. But oftentimes when you find yourself in the world, especially around a social topic, the options that are given to you as a follower of Jesus um, are not great options. And so you, you see politically, you go, here's one option, and here's the second option. You go, uh, I don't know if either of those actually line up with, with the way of Jesus completely. So sometimes I'm here, sometimes I'm there. I'm more liberal than conservatives like. I'm more conservative than liberals like. And this is the dance. And so we walk through multiple places where that issue comes up. And, and we got to walk into those places and say, what, is, what does God have to say about money, about sexuality, about church, about abortion, about racism, all of these different topics. But listen, the truth is we could go like, a hundred weeks on different topics that come up, uh, but we're not going to do that, thankfully. Um, we're we're going to stop this week, and hopefully by the end of this, we'll have given you a template that allows you to operate in the world as a person of salt and light based on an understanding of who God has asked you to be. And so that's what we're going to try to do today, because again, out there in the world, there's a ditch on this side and there's a ditch on this side, and often obedience to Christ looks like staying in the middle of those two Ditches, and, and I submit to you that even your very salvation, uh, in some ways, was God preventing you from falling into one ditch or another. So, for instance, one of the ditches over here, when it comes to salvation and God and creation, and all these things, uh, is a ditch called relativism. Okay, I'll just illustrate this. Relativism is the belief that there's no objective morality that can give us a standard to be measured by. That's relativism. So people say there is no standard. Then over here, there's moralism. Moralism is a ditch that says, uh, I believe that we can achieve righteousness by the means of proper moral behavior. So relativism, relativism says there is no standard. Moralism says there is a standard and I'm awesome at meeting that standard. And I'd like to tell all of you about it. And so th those are the two ditches. And then here we come uh, as followers of Jesus and, and the gospel shows up and says, um, I got good news and bad news. Uh, the bad news is there is a standard relativism, sorry, uh, and it's so high that all of you have failed and now deserve death. Moralism, that's a problem for you. And so there is a standard, and it's so high that all of you have failed. Good news, I love you so much. I've sent forth my son to live up to a standard you could never live up to, to die in your place and offer you the gift uh, of imputed righteousness, the gift of righteousness that you didn't earn. And so that, that was the salvation narrative and what was supposed to happen when you were drug out of one ditch or the other. Either way, I've, I was kind of in both. I like to play on both sides. That was my story. And so it came to a place where you've been saved. Then what was supposed to happen when you received salvation was this. You were supposed to get a gospel-shaped mind, a mind that is shaped by the gospel. And your gospel-shaped mind, this is important, was supposed to think right thoughts about God and those right thoughts were to go down into your heart and that would cause you to have right feelings about God. So your mind thinks right thoughts about God. That feeds your heart and your heart has right feelings about God. But because of sin and because of the fact that we're not there yet, we haven't arrived perfectly yet, our mind doesn't always think right thoughts, which means our heart is fed lies. Therefore, our heart doesn't always feel the right feelings. But listen, I submit to you, that this battle in your mind, this truth battle, is the primary thing we need to talk about as we close out this third way series. Because here's my thesis, that every one of these third way battles is a truth battle playing out in your mind. Every one of these third way battles is a truth battle that is playing out in your mind. So just go through the last five, six weeks that we've talked about. When you think about church, what's the truth you believe about church? That's a battle in your mind and that's going to feed your heart and then you're going to have thoughts on that. When you think about money, what, what do you think about when you think about money? What's the truth about money? That's going to feed your heart. When you think about sexuality, where do you get your truth on that? And does it feed into your heart? Every one of these is a battle going on in your mind and it is a battle of truth. And what's offered to us in the world is two options. One option is cultural truth which essentially says whatever culture says is true progressively or conservatively, depending on where you find yourself. What culture says is ultimately the authority on the matter. What people say around me, what news says, 
What, what articles say, that's the truth. And then the other option is personal truth, which says, I don't really care about culture. I'm going to decide whatever I want. I'm my own God. I'm my own authority. And ultimately, these are the two things that are offered. So I can trust the cultural truth that like changes every couple of days usually, or I can trust my own truth, which could be affected on whether or not I eat a burrito tonight. That could affect how I feel, and then I have a different belief about God, and who knows what's going to happen. I'm, I'm making jokes, but like indigestion will really jack up your theology. It happens. You wake up and you're like, do I have this thought or did I have bad pizza? I don't know. And so it's shallow, but it's true. And, and these are the options before us. But, but again, it, this may sound very uh, esoteric and philosophical, but we all have to answer the question, what is truth? What, what is truth? And how do I get my mind around that truth so that it gives my thoughts, uh, gives my heart the right thoughts that then can feel the right feeling? So uh, I'm going to read you some scriptures when it comes to what is truth. And I want to try to let the Bible tell us what truth is. And just using the book of John, Jesus' uh, disciple John wrote about Jesus. And here's what he said. There's seven different places where he talks about truth. So in John 1.14, it says this. It says, the word became flesh and made its dwelling among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son, Jesus, who came from the Father full of grace and truth. Jesus came into this world full of grace and truth. John 1, 17, for the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So there it is again. Here's who he is, grace and truth. John 4, verse 24, God is spirit and his worshipers must worship him in spirit and in truth. So if we are going to worship God, we have to do so rightly. There is a right way. There's a truthful way. We got to get our thoughts in order when we worship God. Nothing stirs my affection more in worship than when I agree with the song lyric on the screen. When I go, that is true. I love that. And nothing bumps me out more than bad theology on a screen. I'm like, that's not true. Our worship leaders don't do that. But there are some that are out there. We, they don't do that because we, we, uh, we fear monger them. Uh, because we're like, if you sing the wrong things, like, then I'm falsely worshiping God and he's going to be mad at us. It works great. Um, just jokes, guys. Jokes. All right. Tough crowd. Or bad jokes. I don't know. Uh, John chapter 8, verse 32. This is good. Uh, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free, Jesus says. So the way by which I get freedom is through truth. That there's lies keeping me from freedom. I'm going to know the truth and the truth is going to set me Free. John 14, 6, the most ludicrous claim of Jesus of all. This claim of Christ is still like rippling through the world to this day. John 14, 6, Jesus answered, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. It's not what is truth when it comes to Jesus. It's who is truth. There, there's this picture I always think of when I read John 14, 6, when Jesus is in front of Pontius Pilate. And Pilate's about to send Christ to the cross, and they're having this conversation, and Jesus says, uh, yeah, I'm a king, but my kingdom is not of this world. And Pilate, you would know that if you knew the truth. And Pilate looks at Jesus and says, what is truth? And Jesus doesn't respond. And there's this great book by Frederick Buechner where he says, the reason Jesus didn't respond to the question of what is truth is because Jesus was truth. And when you are the truth and someone asks you what is truth, you just sort of stand there and stare at them. What is truth? You're looking at it. I don't know, me. It's right here. And so he doesn't say the truth is out there. He says truth is in me as a person. I am the truth. John 16, 13. But when he, the spirit of truth, this is the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. And he will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears. And he'll tell you what is yet to come. John 17, verse 17, sanctify them by the truth. This is Jesus' prayer. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. So Jesus actually has a lot to say when it comes to truth. So the quickest definition we can give around the idea of what is truth is this. Truth is God's perspective on any subject. Any subject that we're talking about. The truth of that subject is what God thinks about that subject. So whenever I can get my mind around what God thinks about something, I've gotten my mind around truth. 
And so the question we should be asking all the time is, if you're a follower of Jesus, is this. You should be asking the question, when I enter into a social space and when I'm brought forth a topic that maybe I don't understand or know about, my first question should be, what does God think about that? Because what God thinks about that is the truth on the matter. What God's perspective is on that is the best thing about it. It's not cultural. It's not personal. God's perspective is the truth. And so what that means for us and this is where it gets, gets a little more specific and a little bit more dicey, is this. That if it's true that God's perspective on the subject is truth, then our authority on any subject is God's word and his will expressed in an inerrant Bible. So you go, God's perspective on the subject, that's truth. Well, how do I know what God's perspective is on any subject? My authority for knowing what God's perspective is on any subject is found in his will and his word primarily and only in the inerrant Bible. Now, the word inerrant means incapable of being wrong. It means without fault or error of any kind. So the authority we have on any subject saying this is the truth about that subject is not found in ourself. It's not found in culture. It's found because God's word and God's will was revealed in a Bible that's without error. Now that gets, that gets hard because right away you go, hang on a second, man. Like, you, you, have you read this? Like, there's like a story like right at the beginning where like this invisible God creates everything. Like, have you read that? And then there's a story where like this guy named Jonah falls off a boat. Maybe he was thrown off the boat and like a big fish eats him. And then that brother's like alive in there for three days. You've read that? Like, there's another story where there's like this ax head that falls in the river and then some guy calls it out and then it's like back. There's another story of a prophet who's like old and there's these these young guys that make fun of him and this prophet calls the bears and the bears go kill this young group of dudes. Like if you read that story, that story is awesome. But like, <laughs> like that's in here. There's, there's others. So you're like, Josh, come on, man. Like with intellectual integrity, you're going to tell me that this is without error. And my response is, it takes faith to believe the Bible. Just like it takes faith to believe culture. Just like it takes faith to believe yourself. It takes faith. I'm not suggesting it doesn't take faith, but I'm also not suggesting it's a blind faith. It absolutely takes faith. But I remember growing up and I was like, the Bible can't be true. That can't be real. And my leader at the time, he took his Bible and he like set it across the room. And he was like, just pretend the Bible's over there for a second. Historically speaking, there was a man named Jesus. That's just history. Go to the library, Josh. Just history. And this man named Jesus was a miracle worker. And this man named Jesus was killed by the Roman Empire. History. That's just history. And then they buried him. History. He was, he was rude to me. Uh, it was great. History. And then after they buried him, uh, like no one could find his body after a couple days. That's just what happened in history. And then all these people that followed him like went out and changed the whole world. History. And so whether or not you believe the Bible, that's fine, but don't, don't pretend like Jesus wasn't a real person and he didn't interact in human history. Because if you were to say, Josh, why do you believe the Bible? I believe the eyewitnesses who saw the resurrection of Christ and then went out and changed the world. And if the resurrection of Christ is true and Jesus affirmed the Old Testament to be true, then that brother Jonah fell off a boat and lived in a fish for a couple days. That's what happened. Because the resurrection of Christ happened. So I'm saying it takes faith. I'm not saying it doesn't take faith, but I'm not saying it's blind. There's a real thing here. It takes faith to believe all of this. But listen, I, it doesn't, it's not hard to find churches and leaders who don't believe that's true. It's not hard to find people that think, oh, this is, some of this is true, some of it's not. No, no, not at Resonate. The whole thing, all of it, inerrancy of the word of God is the place by which we find our truth. And that is significant for us. Because we have got to get our mind around truth. Because the more you get your mind around truth, the more you can enter into these spaces and be salt and light. Because the Bible says something crazy happens. When a, when a person with the Holy Spirit, when a person who's saved reads the Bible, it's like magic, guys. If you like Harry Potter, this is your moment, okay? It's like, it's like when, a, when a person with the Holy Spirit reads the Bible, that the Bible actually comes to life. Like, like the spirit of God inside of me and the spirit of God inside the word of God starts to interact with one another. And it's like the book is alive. The theological word is illumination. 
that I see things in this word that God is revealing to me. So for some person who doesn't believe, it's just a literature book. For me who believes, it's the living and active breath of God speaking to me. That's why this is a big deal. So we've got to get around this. We have to know our Bibles, love our Bibles, cherish our Bibles, study our Bibles. Charles Spurgeon would tell his students, visit many books, but live in the Bible. And I think for us, it's like we, we visit the Bible and live in many books. We have to know the word. We have to live this word. Because the Holy Spirit inside of you and the Bible in front of you is trying to give you God's truth. That's what I'm saying. And 2 Corinthians, sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 picks up on this. When Apostle Paul, he says this. He says, the person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness. And he cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. There are some things that God is speaking to you that only the Spirit of God can reveal to you. And someone else who doesn't have that Spirit would say, that's foolishness. And you'd say, no, it's awesome, it's wise, it's amazing. And that's how this works. And the person with the Spirit makes judgments about all things. But such a person is not subject to merely human judgments. For who has known the mind of the Lord as to instruct him? This This is huge. The end of verse 16. But we have the mind of Christ. But we have the mind of Christ. The Spirit of God in me, the Word of God in front of me, is transforming me into the mind of Christ. I've been given the mind of Christ, and I'm being transformed to ultimately having the mind of Christ. So listen, we've come to Christ for salvation, but that's not the only thing we've come for. We have come to be transformed in his likeness. And we are primarily transformed into his likeness by receiving his mind. That that God wants us to think his thoughts about things. God wants us to be grieved about things because of the thoughts we think about things. He wants us to get excited about stuff because of what he thinks about. God wants us to have the mind of Christ. And through the Spirit of God inside of us and Word of God in front of us, that is how truth is delivered to us. So we need to to get much more intrigued and interested in how we can get rid of the mind of culture and get rid of the mind of ourselves and get on the mind of Christ. So again, the first way that's offered to us, we'll call it the mind of culture. The mind that follows after culture. The second option that's been given to us is the mind of self. It's self-interested and self-seeking and usually finding comfort and security and gratification as its primary agenda. The, the mind of culture and the mind of self. And the third way that we represent, that we say, if we can live like this, we can be salt and light in the world, is rejecting the mind of culture, rejecting the mind of self, and taking on the mind of Christ. As you go into every scenario, as you go into every place, you start to ask yourself, what's God's perspective on this? How do I get the mind of Christ on this so that my mind can tell my heart what it needs to feel? And when I get the mind of Christ, then I have a chance to be salt and light in the world. Uh, My wife, Amy, is a licensed mental health counselor. And she did a living room sessions where a bunch of girls come over uh, and they talk for for like, you know, six hours or however long girls talk. It was give or or take a few minutes there, right? Uh, And so like 40 40 girls came over um, and Amy was talking about mental health. And she was, she was sharing her story about mental health and she was talking about uh, how you engage mental health and, and how the gospel plays into that. And I, was, uh, I got to read her notes and I was like, these notes are so good. Um, I like stole a bunch of them for tonight, honestly. Uh, and, and here's what was sweet. She was talking about mental health and she said, there's absolutely times uh, when you need to take medicine for mental health. Absolutely. Uh, just like you would take medicine for uh, a body ache, you take medicine for mental health. That's, that's on the table. And there's other times where you absolutely need to go to see a counselor. You need to talk that stuff out. You need to work that stuff out. And you need to progressively work through some stuff over a scheduled plan of time. You need to do that. And this was great. And then she, she said, and there's also times when you need to, to not just take medicine and not just see a counselor, but you need to fight back and say to those thoughts, I have the mind of Christ. I have the mind of Christ. And that negative thought, that insecure thought, that thought that's been dominating me, that that deceiving, lying thought is trying to enter in, but I have the mind of Christ. And she made these girls, like some of you were there, like she made them, like put their hands on their temple and say over and over again, I have the mind of Christ. I have the mind of Christ. 
I have the mind of Christ. And I was like, how many times do they have to do it? And she was like, it was like a lot. Like you would have been awkward. And I'm like, but like how many? She's like, probably 20 plus. I have, the, which is a lot. I, to me, that's way too many. I have the mind of Christ. I have the mind of Christ. And so what she's saying is there are times in our life where the cultural mind is trying to enter in saying, this is cultural pressure. This is what should be normal. This is what progressive looks like. This is what year it is. You need to get with it. And you go, no, no, no. I have the eternal mind of the one true living Lord, Jesus Christ. I have the mind of Christ. And there's other times where you're drawn to this personal thing, the self-seeking, and, and is more about your interest than the interest of others. I have the mind of Christ. And over and over and over again, the third way for us, the way we enter into the world as salt and light, is by taking on the mind of Christ. But this has been majorly downplayed in our world. Majorly downplayed. So as we thought about how practical we could make this, we started writing out like the, the mind of Christ uh, trusts the Lord with, with everything. The mind of Christ doesn't lean on its own understanding. The mind of Christ, and we started like listing out some stuff. And then we thought there's actually a scripture that says everything the mind of Christ does. We're like, why don't we just read that scripture? So, so the most practical way we could end this series is by trying to show you the outworking of a life that has the mind of Christ. And it's in Proverbs chapter 3. You may have this on a coffee mug if you grew up with a grandma who loves Jesus. Very practical, very well-known verse. But again, radically misunderstood and underutilized. So, so I'm going to read this to you. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5. 5 through 8. It says this. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him, and he will show you which path to take. I love verse 7. Do not be impressed with your own wisdom. Instead, fear the Lord and turn away from evil. Then you will have healing for your body and strength for your bones. So this passage basically lays out a life that is obedient and operating with the mind of Christ. And there's some subtlety in this that I think we've got to talk about. Some really beautiful subtlety that's hidden in this passage. So, so number one, what does it say? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Here's the subtlety. It doesn't say trust in your heart. It says trust in the Lord with all your heart. It totally rejects the idea of you trusting in your heart. And so probably the most a uh, well-known doctrine of the cultural mind is the doctrine called follow your heart. That is the primary logo. If they made t-shirts, that would, it was what it would say. Hashtag follow your heart. There is not one verse in the Bible that tells you to follow your heart. Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things. Who can count its wickedness? There's a fun Bible verse if you want a memory. Uh, <laughs> Memory verse this week. Write that on your mirror. The heart is wicked above all things. Put that on your social media post tomorrow. <laughs> the fall is so beautiful. Hashtag heart is deceitful. <laughs> You're not going to get a bunch of likes. Because that's bumming people out. Why are you bumming me out, man? That follow your heart nonsense has led so many of us, myself included, I'm guilty of this, has led us into absolute foolishness. And if you think back on most of the decisions you've made that you regret, what you usually say when you think back is, what was I thinking? What was I th Why did I get that haircut? Why was I wearing that? Why did I date him? Why did I spend that money? What was I thinking? And oftentimes what you did doesn't even make sense to you now. And oftentimes it's because you were following your heart. And so listen, if, if you really want to understand what it means to trust in the Lord with all your heart, it means this, that when you see clearly God's truth on a subject, you choose to obey God's truth, and then you turn and look at your heart and say, hey, you need to follow along whether you like it or not. So don't follow your heart, lead your heart. Pull your heart along. And tell it to be transformed. And fight back against this nonsense of follow your heart. Because listen, the Lord and his word should be the strongest influence over your life. And the Holy Spirit's promptings in you should be the strongest influence in your life. Not your desire to see your desires come to fruition. 
So trust in the Lord with your heart. Don't trust your heart. Number two, don't rely on your own understanding. That means you need to second guess your thoughts. Don't rely on what you understand, but test things and poke things and prod things and ask questions and go, I'm not sure. I'm thinking this. Is that true? Is that right? Because listen, we should not rely on our own understanding because most of the things of God do not make sense to us. A lot of the things of God don't make sense to us, especially in the culture we live in and the world we're, we're, we're brought up in. Like a lot of the things of God don't make sense to us. You know what doesn't make sense? Um, getting out of college and getting married really young, like right out of college or even in college, that's even crazier. Like getting married in college and then choosing to like move to a new city uh, and take a job doing anything for the sake of the church. That is absolute absurdity. I was at a wedding recently where the couple just got out of college and they're getting married and they're moving to a new city to be a part of a church plant. And it makes no sense to people. Like I was talking to their family members. They're like, oh, you're one of the leaders of that church that does that crazy stuff. Yeah, this, this, is, this wasn't much of a wedding. It should have been a funeral. Like watching these two young people throw away their lives. You're like, that sounds like, that sounds like the cultural mind. That sounds like the personal mind. Those two young people have the mind of Christ. And it looks really different for them. And they say, young people can't make those kind of commitments. They can't do that kind of stuff, which is logically so bizarre that we send 18, 19, and 20-year-olds in our United States military overseas to lay down their lives for each other if necessary. But then we can't say that 19, 20, 21-year-olds can get married and lay down their lives for one another. It's absolute logical absurdity. It's the cultural mind and the personal mind dominating your story. Lean not on your own understanding. Second guess all the things you're being told. And ask the question, is that the mind of Christ? The Christian life is not practical. It's not sensible. One of our pastors turned down, like one of our pastors in our church, right, after he graduated college, got a six-figure job offer, and he turned it down with joy. And the CEO was like, oh, turning me down. What, what, do, you, what do you got going for? Is there a better gig? Maybe I can make an offer. He's like, I, I want to be a pastor in a church, actually. Oh, that's different. Okay. Um, are they paying you really well? Like, tell me about this church. No, I've got to like ask people to be on my team to give me money. Like, would you like to be on my team to give me money uh, so I can do this? And he's like, no, I, that doesn't make sense at all. And, and there's, a, there's, there's a sense by which I can not lean on my own understanding. And on the other side of me not leaning on my own understanding is the fullness of joy in the foolishness of Christ. Brendan Manning has a great book called The Importance of Being Foolish. And he just talks about how upside down the life of Jesus was. Don't lean on your own understanding. Second guess your thoughts. Then this passage progresses and it says, In all of your ways acknowledge him. In all of your ways acknowledge him. Allowing God's word to be decisive in our lives is the way that in all of our ways we acknowledge him. So no matter where I go, no matter where I find myself, I'm going to acknowledge who God is and I'm going to, have the, I'm going to fight for the mind of Christ as I have interactions in the world and I'm going to acknowledge him in all my ways and I'm going to let his word be decisive in my life. This is, this is probably the hardest one for you because a lot of you in this room know what God's word says about something but to be honest, you're like kind of looking for like the side deal with God. You're like, I know your word like really clearly says this, but I was wondering if maybe you could make an exception for me and my story and the stuff I'm going through. And then oftentimes there's many of you that have actually like found yourself believing that in prayer, God has told you something that is counter and, and, and different than his word has said. I've heard this like, oh, I, I can live with my boyfriend or girlfriend and sleep with him. Like, it's no big deal. God's cool with it. Oh, I'm not sure you were talking to God. Um, because God's word is not cool with it. Yeah, but like God's different now. He's changed. Um, okay, uh, but no, he has. No, no, no. Like it's, it's 2018. Like he's cool with it now. Okay, um, so many things to come at this. Um, but listen, the, it's grace and truth. And, and so anytime you see that misunderstanding, you lovingly go, hey, can, can we have a Bible study? Can we talk about this over Bible study? Because I, I want you to see that God's for your good. And he doesn't have a side deal with you. So many people in our church are looking for God's voice outside of God's word. Listen, you're not going to find his voice outside of his word. And 95% of his will has already been revealed to you through Bible verses. 
Stop looking for voices when you have verses. There's plenty of verses for so many things. He doesn't have a side deal with you. Now, there's interpretation that has to happen, and that, that's fun. That's fun to have Bible interpretation. But the majority of his will is clear. I remember being in, in college, and we would study a passage of Scripture, and our, our uh, Bible professor would be like, hey, just, uh, just so you know, if, if you think that you have an interpretation of a Bible verse, that you can't find any other person to have that same interpretation, go ahead and say that you're wrong. And we'd be like, uh, Dr. Bob, that's rude. Like, we're up and coming scholars. Like, maybe God's saying new stuff. And he's like, no, 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 no. Like, lots of people have read the Bible. Lots of people have written stuff. Like, if you have a new interpretation, go ahead and say you're wrong, junior in college who just started this course. Like, humble yourself. But, but again, that's, that's, our, that's, our per, that's the personal mind saying me and God have a side deal. In all of your ways, acknowledge him. Let his word be decisive in your life. If God's word says something, will that settle that matter for you or are you going to go another way? This is hard. I know this is hard. But this is how you look like salt and light in the world. When you say, no, no, that, that thing's settled. That thing's settled. And then lastly, it says this. It says, he will show you the path to take. He'll show you. Now, that's a progressive showing. He's not going to lay it all out for you. It's a progressive showing. He'll show you the path you should take. So the Christian life, on one hand, is enjoying being led by the Lord while also embracing the uncertainty of being led by the Lord. And so you're, you're saying, God, I want your mind. I want to think like you think. And I want you, to, I want you to show me the path I should take. And I want to be humble enough to say, God, I, I don't know where I'm going. I don't have this all figured out. I don't want to enjoy the process. But God, I want to cling to the fact that you know what's best. And there's a sweet posture in this passage that I think so many of us need to take. That the Bible is actually inviting all of us to be the kind of people who are coachable. That the Holy Spirit coaches us and changes us. The Word of God coaches us. Our leaders, they coach us. I love that terminology of, of being led like a coach leads. And gives directives and, and lets you try things and then comes back and you talk it out. And then you go and try and you come back and you talk it out. There's a testing and approving here of the path that God's laid out for you. But there's a coachability that we need to have as, as followers of Jesus. If you have any sports background, you know that, that it really works best uh, when you see like that, that sometimes the best athletes are also the most coachable. The ones that are the best on the team, they, they want to show up early. They want to be coached. They want to hear from someone that knows more than them. It's often the guys that are kind of like not that good or in the middle of the pack that are like, no, I want to show my own way. And they're not coachable and they miss it. Um, th this is so random, but I have this friend. I like grew up with her. Like we went to church together. And over the last few years, she became like amazing at American Ninja Warrior. Do you guys know? Please tell me. Please, God, tell me you know what American Ninja Warrior is. Yes, right? Yeah. It's amazing. I wish I could do it, but I have no upper body strength like that. Really, it's coarse. I got no strength anywhere, okay? Uh, I can't, can't do any of it. But my friend, it's like, like top three girls in American Ninja Warrior. Her name is Barclay. And they did this thing recently where they asked Olympic athletes, um, specifically the, the Olympic gold medalist gymnast team, uh, to join in with the American Ninja Warrior, and they were going to go through the course. And so Barclay, my friend, was a coach, and she was partnered with an American gold medal gymnast. And, and as they're going through the course, the, the gold medal gymnast, her name was Jordan, she would go through a, uh, an obstacle, and then she would check in with Barclay, and they would talk and go over the next one and check in. And Barclay could, like, walk along the course with her while the, uh, Jordan was going through. And the announcers picked up on this, and they saw it, and they, they said this. They were like, to all you kids out there, I, I don't know if you're watching this, um, but you have before you the best gymnast in the whole world being unbelievably coachable. Like elite athletes are infinitely coachable and they want to be coaches. And so when you think about this, this mind of Christ concept, if you want to be a mature follower of Jesus, the maturity that you can get to has all to do with your coachability. Like, how humble are you? How much do you let the Spirit of God coach you and mess with you and prod you and change you? How much do you let the Word of God come at you? And, and so often we're like, oh, I read the Bible. It's like, no, the Bible should read you. You don't read the Bible. The Bible reads you. Oh, I'm applying the Bible to my life. No, no, you need to apply your life to the Bible. Like, that's what coachability looks like. How often do you go to your leaders and say, hey, I was thinking this thought, and it's, I don't know if it's right, and it's maybe not right. And then your leader tells you that's not right, go the other way. And you actually do that. 
I, I tell you, man, the, the best leaders in our church are oftentimes the people who were the most coachable along the way. And so if you say, how, how do we as Christians go into the world and live as salt and light? We have to become the kind of people who the Spirit of God and the Word of God and the community of God come together and they transform us into having the mind of Christ. And then we go into the world and we look like people who can think right and who live right. So we can't do, listen, we can't do a sermon on alcohol. You need the mind of Christ on that. We can't do a sermon on marijuana. We need the mind of Christ on that. We can't do a sermon about your roommates. You probably wish we could. You need the mind of Christ on that. We can't do a sermon on debt. You need the mind of Christ on that. We can't do a sermon on conflict. You need the mind of Christ on that. You can't do a sermon about the fact that you're going to go home over break and have a massive fallout with your family. You need the mind of Christ on that. Just, just, just me, not you? Okay, cool. Uh, you need the mind of Christ for every single scenario. And there's a ditch on either side offering you a chance to fall in. And what you need most is to think God's thoughts about that thing. And then when you get his truth, you, I mean, this is what's so beautiful about this passage, you also get his grace. And so this isn't something that makes you prideful. This is something that humbles you. And this is something that sends you into the world looking different. So you talk to someone, uh, maybe you live in a fraternity or sorority house, or you're on a sports team, and you have people that know your life, and, and they know you have a boyfriend or girlfriend, and they know that, that you and your boyfriend or girlfriend are doing things really differently. And they're like, why are you guys doing it differently? Like, don't you know that you should like try some stuff out before you like get too serious? And you're like, that, that sounds like the cultural mind speaking to me. And don't you know you guys like need to, you know, like push back some stuff until you get all your comfort and security figured out? That, that sounds like the personal mind speaking. But listen, I want to have the mind of Christ. And this is what it looks like to have the mind of Christ. It looks like dating to become best friends so that maybe we can live on mission together. That's, that's the mind of Christ. And I submit to you that most people in one ditch or another are looking for a way out. And the way you look like salt and light in the world is having the mind of Christ and obeying it and walking in that truth every single day at all times. You've got to get this figured out. And we should want the mind of Christ because it was given to us at the cost of Christ himself. You and I are offered his mind because he laid down his body in our place. And we should not just settle for the salvation of God, as glorious as that is. We should strive for the transformation of God. That he would transform us, that he would give us his heart, he would give us his mind, he would give us his hands, he'd give us his feet, and we'd be transformed into his likeness. And then as we go into the world, we get to see how glorious it is to be different. But not just different for random sake. Different because we see the world through Christ's eyes. And we have his perspective on the subject. So if you've seen what he's offered to you in his life, and you've received his salvation, then it, it might be pretty easy for you to ask this question. Where in your life right now are you leaning on your own understanding? Where in your life right now do you not have the mind of Christ? Where, where do you need to right now put your hands to your head and say, I have the mind of Christ. I have the mind of Christ. What thought that deceitful enemy is trying to deceive you with thoughts? Where do you need to put your hands up and say, no, no more. I have the mind of Christ. I have the mind of Christ. Where in your life right now do you not have his mind? And here's what it looks like. If you're a follower of Jesus, that, that thing, that place should be easy to identify, usually. And then you look at that thing and you go, I don't have your mind on this, Lord. And I want your mind on this. Not because of shame or fear or guilt. I want your mind because it's joy and freedom and truth. I want, I want what you offer because it's good. And so God, I repent. I repent of this. I turn from this thinking. And I believe that you know better than that. And you have my best in mind. And so God, even though I don't trust it, and even though my heart's telling me to go this way, and even though culture's telling me to go this way, I'm going to go your way, and I'm going to tell all that other stuff. It needs to follow along. Because your word is decisive in my life. So right now, where, where do you not have his mind? Where are you thinking things that are your own thoughts, not his thoughts? And whatever those places are, would, would you identify that? And would you repent? Would you believe? And would you ask God to transform you?